Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Braden City Council meeting, September 23rd, 2020. City Council Chambers will be open to the public. All are welcome to attend this meeting. Social distancing and screening will be enforced. Any member of the public wishing to comment may do so at the meeting. Citizens may also submit their comments in writing to city clerk at cityofbradenton.com or by voicemail by calling 941-932-9437. All comments must be received yesterday. As always, we begin our deliberations with an invocation and a Pledge of Allegiance. The uh, invocation will be brought to us this morning by Reverend Dr. Teresa M. Capers, pastor of the Rogers Community United Methodist Church. Please come forward. Please stand. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for abiding with us and caring for us in the midst of these unprecedented circumstances due to COVID-19. You, O oh God, walk with us and lead us along paths of uncertainty. You, O oh God, open doors of opportunity. You, O oh God, encourage and comfort our hearts. You, O oh God, know the needs of this city. And you know our blessings as well. We ask now for a sharing of your power and the Holy Spirit, so that these council persons may move confidently in this meeting. And may they boldly employ every gift and every resource at their disposal to address the challenges of our day and our times. May our gathering today be marked by patience, careful listening, and a deep and abiding respect and affection for all of the people whom they serve and represent. We invite you, O oh God, to be present with us today. Please hear our prayer, for it is given in your name. Amen, amen. and amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. Call the meeting to order. Mr. Gallo has an excused absence this morning. Ms. Bushman. Good morning. We have no proclamations this morning. We do have presentation by the Bradenton Police Department, <clears throat> the Florida Contraband Forfeiture Grant Program Awards. Good morning. Good morning. Um, not that every time I show up here is not my favorite day of the week, this particularly <laughs> so, because we get to give away money to organizations Great. within our community or who impact our community who really need it. And this is one of those days for us that I think we truly show our community connection, both as an agency and as a city. Um, as you know, this is our third year since we formalized the uh, the program that I also have Lisa Reeder up here. She is actually my program administrator. And I know she works very hard on this. Um, I like to brag each time I get up here that uh, per the state requirements, we need to give away 25% of what we bring in. Um, that would have equaled this year about $3,700. What I'm pleased to tell you is that with the uh, donations that we're gonna be making to these nonprofits today, along with donations that we make throughout the year, we're sitting at $21,000. Um, you all can do the math. We do more than we're required to do, um, but I think there's an obligation on our part to do all that we can. And so I'm, I'm pleased to, to do that. I'm gonna call up each organization one by one, and we're gonna present the check, check. we're gonna take a picture. If y'all wanna make any comments at any point, uh, feel free to interrupt me. I know 
Some of you all recommended some of these agencies uh, apply for these funds, and I appreciate you doing that, Councilwoman Barnaby. I know you did. Um, so I appreciate that. So the first person we're going to call up is the Boys and Girls Club of Manatee County. Um, they are getting the check today for $600. I'm going to have Dawn come up. Um, the grant funding will be used to reward club members for completing drug prevention programming, improving academics, good behavior, and citizenship. The fund will help create an evening of community engagement between members of BPD, I'm looking forward to that by the way, club members and families of the Boys and Girls Club located at Rogers Garden Elementary School. Don, if you want to say a couple words. Good morning. I want to thank you all so much for your support of the Boys and Girls Club. We have had such a long-standing, wonderful relationship and these times are very challenging for everyone and not just because of COVID. And so we are very blessed to have you in our lives to promote citizenship with our children, good community support and relationship building. We want them to make the best choices possible for themselves. And part of that is having a positive relationship with our police force. And they really do go above and beyond. It's not just about having a one-time event. They're there throughout the year not just at Rogers Garden, but at multiple Boys and Girls Club locations. And for some of the kids that we serve, it may be the only time they see the police in something that's a positive environment versus things they may be challenged with at home. And so we want them to, to see them as an ally as we do and to build that trust and respect for each other. And we couldn't be more proud of this relationship. And thank you so much for the financial support as well. I'll give you a hug, but I can't. <laughs> Thank you. A drug-free manatee, $1,500. Uh, we provided them funding to educate employers and employees of the value of a healthy, unimpaired workforce by providing education, training, and public recognition of employers that participate in the drug-free workplace. This grant allows them to launch the Healthy Minds Healthy Workplace campaign. I'm really looking forward to hearing and seeing a little bit more about that. Um, is Linda here? Yes, Linda Thompson. Hi. There you are. So, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. As the new leader of Drug Free Humanity, um, I have been amazed at the being embraced by this community and and all the exciting things we're going to do. Along with um, this particular campaign is, is one that I've brought to the table to try to address a call from the County of Manatee to uh, work with our young adults, 18 to 35, who are at very high risk of substance use and also represent the foundation for the next families in um, the community. And so uh, what, we're, what we're launching, and I'm looking forward to the support from, from the city and from Chamber of Commerce and, and from all of the community members to, to kind of um, uh, make a, a paradigm shift beyond preventing uh, substance abuse uh, for those uh, that are vulnerable to that, but also um, uh, transforming the community into one that responds to, to individuals as well. So the Healthy uh, Minds, Healthy Workplace, uh, we're going to start with, with this donation to um, pilot this year 50 businesses within the community uh, to, to train them on things like how to create a healthy workplace, um, how to support their employees with uh, healthy um, uh, and social support and also to train them on things like the use of Narcan um, and um, how to help their employees if their employees um, are struggling with substance use. So we're really excited to get this going and see what comes, what comes out of transformation. So thank you. Thank you. Replay Outreach, um, $2,000. A Success for Life training program is designed to encourage at-risk teens to uncover their unique purpose in life, learn to manage their behavior and gain the necessary skills to be successful in the workplace. The end result is a roadmap to their future. Larry Rose. Uh, 
Oh, and Vernon Kearney. Yeah, no. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, all right, go ahead. How you guys doing today? First of all, I just want to say thank you for working alongside of us. Uh, Replay Outreach, we specialize in character building and leadership. We really believe in building up the kids, showing them the right traits so they can get out into the community and be uh, better citizens. Uh, you know, we like to take them on different types of field trips, expose them to different things to get them out of their comfort zone um, in order to let them see new horizons and things of that nature. With this money you guys are, are giving us, we're going to be able to do more field trips, do more activities, have more resources. So I just want to say thank you. And we truly appreciate you all. Humane Society, Manatee County, $2,500. I know that this is your, I think, their third year receiving this. Uh, provides a safe haven, routine care, medical assessment, care for animals removed from homes by BPD when cruelty and neglect charges are being investigated. Um, that's a great organization. We always uh, provide not only financial support, but also personnel. Uh, Rick Yoakum is here to say a few words. Good morning. Uh, first to Lisa, Chief Bevan, and the Bradenton Police Department. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Um, to the council and mayor, um, we truly appreciate your continued support of the Humane Society of Manatee County and what we're trying to do. Um, it's been a excruciatingly difficult time for everyone, but I can't think of a better community for support to work in and then then Bradenton and, and Manatee County. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. We've operated every day since the pandemic started, albeit at a reduced capacity because we had staffing issues like everyone else. I'm proud to say that we now have a larger staff than when the pandemic started. We've expanded in our veterinary clinic by opening up our new dental surgical suite, which will double the capacity for us to do dentals. We purchased the property next to the veterinary clinic on 14th Street at 2407 and 2411 14th Street. And that's for an expansion of shelter capabilities, as well as an education center in the future that will be made available to anyone in the community in law enforcement, nonprofits, or animal welfare. So we've got a lot of plans. We're only able to do this because of the support that we receive from all of you that I mentioned when I first stepped up here. So on behalf of the Humane Society of Manatee County, thank you all very much. Next, we have the Manatee County Girls Club, um, just for girls, $2,500. Um, the club provides before and after school programs, alternative education for disadvantaged and underserved girls ages 5 to 17. The Serve and Protect Project will provide a kid track system and secure, secure database for identification, member photos, and student family records. This is a crucial component to keep the girls secure, protected, and accounted for. This is a very expensive program. We've actually been looking for somebody to spearhead this in our, our community because it was a little financially out of our reach. And I'm so pleased to see that they are diving in and we're, we're pleased to give them $2,500. Drina Green. Good morning. Good morning to G. Bevan, Lisa, and their team, to the full council, Mayor Poston, Manatee Girls Club alum, Sister Mary Ann. Um, again, my name is Drina Green. I am the program administrator for Just For Girls. And Just For Girls has been providing quality services to Manatee County for 51 years. And we are still as fully committed to doing that as when the journey began. Um, Chief Bevan alluded to some of our demographics. Um, I'm sure you know we're located geographically in three places, East Manatee, West Bradenton, and Palmetto. Um, but we serve some of the county's highest at-risk populations with 96% um, of our population being free and reduced recipients. 56% um, of those are single parent led by female households. And of those households, 64% earn less than $20,000 per year. 
Um, so those families are what we classify as your Alice families or your working poor. So they are also at risk for academic, social, emotional, mental, um, adverse childhood experiences. So with this program, the support of this program, building sustainability and in, in infrastructure for us, it allows us to build on our prevention programs of academics, behavior, and character, and be able to refine the data and analysis and also offer additional services to those families. So without your help, we wouldn't be able to do so. So again, on behalf of our CEO, more than 500 families that we serve each year, we do thank you. New Manatee Broncos, uh, $2,500. Um, the Manatee Broncos is an organization for children 5 to 14 years old to play football, ages 4 to 14 for cheerleading. An estimated 90% of the children are from low-income families. Their motto is God, family, and school because it is about more than just sports. They use sports to keep the kids off the streets, and the funds will be used to purchase proper safety equipment. Um, this is another organization that uh, not only do we provide financial support, but we try to really engage with the youth out there. Some of the, the leads on this, and I, did I see some of them here? Yes, there they are, right in front of me. Um, you may recognize um, from uh, being employed here with the city of Brainton, and so we're, we're very pleased to provide them with a check. Um, Charles, why don't you bring the whole, the whole gang down? Come on. <laughs> we, we'll, we're filming it. Come on, Shamika. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm the president of the New Manatee Broncos, and Charles is the vice president, and Shamika is our registrar. Um, like the chief said, they have from this is our fifth year of in the program, and they have been awesome. She comes out along with some other officers. And they speak with the kids. The kids get a positive interaction. They'll say, when is the police lady coming back? And I'm like, that's the chief, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of fun get to see them, get to interact with the police. And um, we do have, we have each season, oh, about 200 kids that participate with us. And it takes a lot of time, effort, and dedication and money. And with the COVID this year, it's been really hard to get out there and fundraise the way we normally do. But we don't only enter at with the kids through football season. We go off season to keep them busy because they are from low incomes. A lot of them don't have father figures. Some don't even have really good mothers, you know, that we, we expect as mothers. So we have to stay engaged. We have to stay with these kids and it takes a lot of funding and we appreciate everything that she has done for us throughout these five years. We Do you guys you. wanna add anything? That's it. Of course you don't. Never lost <laughs> right? Charles. I know. <laughs> uh, PACE Center for Girls, $2,500. Um, you all are very familiar with PACE. Provides girls and young women an opportunity for a better future through education, counseling, training, and advocacy. The girls are all at high risk of abusing drugs and alcohol and on average uh, live in poverty. The new growth and change system is a behavior modification program built on the PACE mission of values and guiding principles. Do we have Amy here, please? Yes. Do what? Good morning, thank you so much for having me. Every time I'm around here, I feel like I'm with friends. So I thank you so much uh, for having Pace here today. So our Embrace Growth and Change system is really what we work with our girls on. A lot of times people think about Pace and they think about school because we know education is the key to their future. But like many of us, I don't know, I'll throw it out there, maybe we have some coping mechanisms that we all use in our life that are maybe less than the best coping mechanisms we could have. I don't know, I could be making a leap of faith here. But our Embrace Growth and Change system is based upon our values and guiding principles. So one of the things that we say to girls when they come to PACE is now is the time to embrace growth and change. And it may be difficult, and we use those guiding principles as our staff as well, because we have to make a lot of changes. We saw that in the, when the pandemic started. Did we ever think we were gonna be able to provide educational services as well as social services virtually? We had to really dig deep. And that's what we talk with our girls about, is how can we learn different coping mechanisms, not the ones that we've been counting on and using over the years, because we all go to those go-to responses, right? 
good, bad, or ugly, sometimes we go to those coping mechanisms. So we work with our girls on understanding that there are different ways that we can cope. And that's what our Embrace Growth and Change system is going to be able to do. It's going to help us continue to work with our girls on making those better and those responsible decision-making skills so that they can be better members of our community. And being here today with all of you, there are lots of opportunities for me to feel bad about what is happening in the world today. And when I sit out here and I see all the good work that everyone is doing, and um, it just inspires me, and I'm so grateful to be here today. It's really the start of my day. Thank you. Why do I always smile with a mask? I know, right? Oh, sorry, I got to take that, right? Um, last but not least, and I'm not going to say it's my favorite, um, but you can read between the lines, the Bradenton Police Explorer post. Uh, the Explorer post is designed for young adults ages nine, or 14 to 20 who have an interest in pursuing law enforcement. Um, I'm sure you all understand and realize the value of a program like this, um, particularly now. We, we've got a lot of kids involved in this. Um, I've got three of my representatives here. I want all three of them to, to come down. Um, Quality Assurance Manager Valerie Knight, Sherry Nichols, and Sergeant Perry Merrill, who um, basically volunteer their time to administer the program. I'm not going to say anything more because I know they have a few things to say. So come on down. Oh, and Officer Pallant. Officer Pallant. Mr. Mayor, City Council, Ms. Lisa, and especially the Chief, we would like to thank you for giving us this money. You, a lot of other places you could have put this money and you put it towards us and we really appreciate it. The young people that we have in our organization are very dedicated and very special young people. So this money will help with, it, with equipment, with training, and everything that we need to make this the best explorer program in the state is what our goal is. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think you all uh, see a theme here um, that we really try to focus on the youth. I say time and time again when I'm up in front of people speaking that these are our future leaders. They're the ones who are going to be sitting in your chairs in really just a few years and making decisions that are going to impact all of us when we're sitting in our easy chairs um, in our homes. I will tell you that I think all of these organizations are incredibly worthwhile. This wasn't just an easy make a phone call, uh, fill something out. Um, Lisa Reeder uh, tried to, to herd everybody, a lot of paperwork involved. A lot of follow-up. We um, chart their progress during the year to make sure that they fulfill what they told us that they were going to do, if they want to be eligible for funding. Um, again, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to present this funding. Um, we're going to excuse them now, and I'm going to want all of you all to go out into the um, big rotunda area right here, and we're going to get a picture with everybody. But thanks to each and every one of you for approving this funding. Uh, we really appreciate it. So, and a, a final clap for all of y'all. We're at the point of the meeting for citizen comments. Citizen comments will be accepted at this time on any consent agenda or non-agenda item. Comments will be accepted on public hearing items at the appropriate time. Anyone who wishes to address the council on any agenda or non-agenda item? Anyone who wishes to speak to council? Anyone at all? Ms. Beauchamp, do you have any phone calls or any? We had no phone calls or no vi or voicemails in the city clerk's office. Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Beauchamp, let's move it. Next, we have the consent agenda. We're asking for approval of items A through I. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, let's vote. Ward two. Yes. Three. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. Consent agenda is approved. The vote is four to zero. Ms. Beauchamp? Under business advertising, petitions, hearings, and communications, we have the first reading of Ordinance 3072, an ordinance of the City of Bradenton, Florida, 
amending Part 1, Charter and Related Laws, Subpart B, Related Laws, Article 4, Police Officers' Retirement System of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Bradenton, Florida. Amending Section 1, Definitions. Amending Section 2, Membership. Amending Section 7, Pre-Retirement Death. Amending Section 8, Disability. Amending Section 9, Vesting. Amending Section 19, Domestic Relations Orders. Retiree Directed Payments. Exemption from Execution. Amending Section 27, Military Service Prior to Employment. Amending Section 28, Prior Police Service. Providing for severability of all provisions, providing for codifications, repealing all ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. Again, this is a first reading, so no vote is required today. We'll go ahead and set the second reading in public hearing for October 14th. All right. The um, next item we have is, is the second reading in public hearing of Ordinance 3068, a quasi-judicial item, so we will administer the oath at this time. Anyone wishing to address council during the following public hearing will stand and raise their right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations which you are about to present to the board will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. We have an ordinance of the city of Bradenton, Florida vacating a portion of a 20-foot wide alley as shown on the plat of Orange Park subdivision. <coughs> recorded in plat book one, page 272 of the public records of Manatee County, Florida being located generally west of 13th Street West at the intersection with 14th Avenue West, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Again, this is the second reading and a public hearing, and we'll be asking for a decision on this today. Thank you. Good morning, Marshall McCurry, Planning and Community Development. Um, I have a brief presentation if you would like, um, but I am available if uh, uh, otherwise. Um, I think you're familiar with this location. It is right. the uh, form, form known as the Manatee Insight, and there's a piece of right, a platted alley that bisects that property. So this would uh, vacate that, and it would cede the ownership to the new owner, who is in fact now uh, Pearl Hunts Partnership 8 LLC. Okay. I'm available for questions if you have any. Yeah, Marshall, I, I noticed the, um, the alley comes down and does a dog leg. Mm -hmm. If you know the property well, um, the road actually continues right straight to 14th, but there's a curb cut. Did that not need to be included? Um, this, was, was you, you see what's mapped. What's being vacated is that that's highlighted in yellow here. Right. So it does not run on all the way out to 14th Street. Okay. But, in, in but fact, there it, was at one point, I mean, because I, I know that everyone drives straight through there. Uh, you know, so it's a, it looks like a dirt road, and then there's a curb cut there. So was that not ever really a, a There a may have been a driveway there at some point. Okay. Yeah, there's a good chance that that may have been a driveway just for the residences that were there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just checking. Mr. Mayor, I grew up not too far from there, and that was a very interesting piece of property to, to begin with. And those teeny tiny little cottages or whatever you want to call that was on there, the, actually, the historical park wanted to get one of them to be able to put at their park. But yes, there was a like a dirt road that went through there. There, it, there wasn't, an, and, and we just we need to vacate it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. You have a question, the marshal? Marshal, thank you. Let's open the public hearing. Anyone who wishes to speak in favor of this ordinance? Anyone in favor? Anyone in favor? Any opposition to this ordinance? Any opposition? Any opposition? Hearing none, close public hearing. Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, move to approve ordinance 3068 vacating the um, public right of way for the Manatee Insight. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 3068. Any more discussion? Hearing none, let's vote. Ward three? Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. Two? Yes. Ordinance 3068 is approved. The vote is four to zero. Ms. Beauchamp. Under new business, we have the police chief with a body camera presentation. <laughs> Good 
Good morning again. Um, as you know, we launched a, a couple months ago a, a T&E on body cameras. Um, today I'm going to let Assistant Chief Kramer, who led that project, the management of that project, um, I'm going to have him come up and walk you through the program, walk you through what we perceive to be um, the expenses involved. We're not necessarily asking for a decision today if you, if you need to mull it over. Um, but, you know, the sooner the better, but um, don't feel compelled. Um, this is really just an informative session for you to, to, to help you make your decision. So, Chief Kramer. Thank you, man. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, council members, and guests. Uh, thank you for allowing me to report today on the department's body-worn camera test and evaluation program. Our goal was to identify the best products available for our officers while continuing to provide excellent customer service. We believe the cameras that we chose will assist in promoting accountability and ensuring the public's trust and confidence in our department. A working group of personnel was created to either test the devices or work on administrative duties associated with the project. IT was also brought in for recommendations including weighing cloud versus server-based options overall cost and efficiency, and network security questions. Based on all these factors, we decided on the cloud-based option. We prioritized the need to test and evaluate camera hardware and associated software for functionality, ease of use, and proof of concept. We created a required camera policy in conjunction with the Southwest Florida PBA per their union contracts and also to meet our accreditation standards. We researched body-worn camera products and decided to test from vendors Axon, WatchGuard, and SafeFleet, and secured equipment to test from Axon and WatchGuard. However, SafeFleet only provided a quote. The test and evaluation period ran for six weeks using 10 different officers. We used the Axon Body 3 and the WatchGuard V300. They tested many aspects of the cameras, including hardware and software capabilities. They received training, and we distributed those cameras across all shifts mainly to see various scenarios and how cameras function in different lighting capabilities. Testers at, were asked for feedback on those experiences in the field and using the cloud-based digital evidence management and redaction functions, which we thoroughly tested. The unanimous choice by our officers was the Axon Body 3 camera. The main factors included the distinct quality difference in the video of the Axon Body 3. And when I say distinct, it is quite stark. In real world use, we need to, to capture the scene as best we can from a single point of view from the officer, and Axon 3 did that best. Night and low light video from the Axon 3 greatly surpassed the V300. The Axon also features what's called the signal vehicle and the signal sidearm functions, which allow the Axon Body 3 to activate upon signal triggers. In a vehicle, this includes speed, emergency lights or crash sensors. And with the sidearm, activation comes from drawing a firearm. And once that activation happens, it activates any cameras within, uh, within a 30 foot radius. We tested, actually it worked at 90 feet inside of buildings. This provides a multiple angle view of critical incidents. These are game changing functions which ensure the most accurate independent accounts of critical incidents available. And Axon is the sole source for the combination of these products. An essential component of camera solutions is storage and evidence usage. Evidence.com from Axon allows evidence from all aspects of the agency, from CSI to records to property and evidence, to all be assembled in individual case files that can be managed by the officers in the cloud, which significantly reduces administrative costs associated with gathering and reproducing said files and creates a much more efficient solution. We decided that 91 of our 123 officers will wear the devices, including the entire patrol division, through the rank of lieutenant and the new CRA positions, our school resource officers and our traffic units, as well as detectives and the special investigations unit. The Axon quote includes a technology assurance plan, which is a lease of the cameras, and includes new cameras at the beginnings of year one, three, and five in a five-year contract. The assurance means that if new technology is developed, our agency will receive that new product at the next camera refresh date in either years three or five. 
This ensures our officers will receive a new product at least every other year in the five-year cycle. Details of the quote include an estimated total cost of $672,200 for the five-year contract. Year one includes cost of hardware and associated annual costs that will recur annually. For year one, we estimate cost to be $151,240. And I say estimate because we are still negotiating with our CAD RMS vendor Central Square, and we believe that according to other agencies and Axon themselves, there is no need to pay for an upcharge for the link that Axon basically has already built. That would cut $23,000 off of year one and $2,000 off the remaining five years to take that total to $128,240 per year for years one through five. One area of concern we came up with during our testing and evaluation was the volume of records that came in. Uh, every officer recording in various scenarios uh, created quite a few. And as a result, we realized that there's a, identified a need for additional personnel to help manage that. Uh, we believe there should be a records body-worn camera lead and also an additional records clerk to help manage that. Uh, that cost would be approximately $65,000, including salary and benefits, for the records lead and about $45,000 for the records clerk. In conclusion, when critical incidents occur, we must depend on our officers to act professionally and with superior results. At those times, an ever-present backup for our personnel must also meet that standard, which the Axon Body 3 does exceptionally. It was a unanimous choice of our testers and provides unique features that the other products simply do not. For those reasons, the Axon Body 3 is our product of choice for body-worn cameras. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. You said the total five years was 670000 Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, the information you sent to us yesterday <clears throat> was 261000 the first year and 240000 for the next four years, which calculates to $1.2 million. That, that does include the personnel cost. So it's one, total cost is $1.2 million. Okay. Right. Okay. We were... The project initially was simply for the acquisition of product, and we've expanded that now at the end of this. We determined that it was, there was definitely a need for personnel. So how do you propose to pay for this? I'll take, I'll take that. Um, so, and I, I think we talked a little bit about this um, uh, prior for the initial purchase of the equipment, um, and we're talking about whether it be the 150 or the, the 130, um, we can use forfeiture seizure dollars for that. Uh, now that can't be a, um, a cost that we take in year two through five um, because of the laws surrounding forfeiture seizure as well. We cannot utilize forfeiture seizure for personnel cost. And so um, whereas we could take care of the, the initial cost of the equipment, everything surrounding that, we cannot pay for what we believe to be the, the required personnel. And, and honestly, we're, we're trying to use um, some guesstimates. We've called other agencies who have already been using this and asked what their needs were when it came to, to time associated with public records requests. Um, I, th I think we're still a little bit on the low end, but um, we would probably be able to, to struggle through that if we needed to. We're, we're trying to be conservative because we understand um, this year. So um, this is something we think is important. We're following suit with many other agencies across the United States. But at the end of the day, it's a financial burden on the city. And so um, I, I guess we hand it to you to, for you to decide if you equally think that this is a need within our city. I have a question. <clears throat> uh, you're suggesting that the year one uh, cost of the cameras is 151000 and you're saying you can cover that cost in forfeiture? Yes, sir. Because I just heard you in the previous presentation when you were giving out the money that 25% of your forfeiture money was only $3,700. That's uh, state forfeiture oh. and a couple things. Um, so, so we've obviously acquired f monies in our forfeiture accounts, federal and state, for many, many years. Um, oh, my so folks will. Th that's just current year. So you have 151000 there? Yes. 
yes, now it's you know it's gonna it's gonna pull from that. But I uh, this is this is why I've been pretty thrifty with that for a rainy day. This is that rainy day. So then that now brings to your total funding request from 1.2 down to about one little over one million dollars. That be correct? Um, well, I'd have to. I'm not the math person here, but that's, that's a round, yeah, yes. round estimate. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Um, so, the you, you the additional cost um, is not just the unit itself, but two two personnel, one at sixty five and one at forty five per year annual salary. Yes, um, there is some flexibility there. Um, we'd be more than happy to to try to start with one person I was just gonna I was just gonna ask whether whether it's necessary to put on two we, we you know if if I could be given the flexibility and and be able to come back and say listen we've tried this it's you know m my fear is and and I don't I didn't bring it to you but every week during the staff meeting Chief Kramer comes with my list of public records requests and it's usually about four pages um, we should assume that with all this additional camera footage, everything that they're asking for now, dash cams, now imagine timesing that by three, because it's not just one officer's body camera out at the scene now, it's, it's all different angles. Um, and so we suspect, based on what we've researched, it's going to take two, okay. but we're, we're happy to, to start with one, knowing that if, if I come back and say we're, we're faltering, then it's going to have to be a pretty quick adjustment okay good and, and, and experience from other agencies is two two is slim okay well and we, we looked at um, for example we looked at Clearwater they're a little larger than us and they actually hired a sworn person I I don't know that we need a sworn person but I do think we need somebody that's very experienced um, that has some experience and and looking out at police footage and understanding redaction and you know Marcy's law in the state of Florida causes us a lot bigger issues than, you know, let's say in New York, um, because their ability to say, I don't want to be on camera if they fall into a certain criteria. And that's, it's not just about, hey, here's the footage. It's about taking a little square and having to, Pixel. yeah. And, and that is just incredibly, incredibly time consuming. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. And then I, 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 and then you did say that you were going to use um, cloud which I think is a good uh, a good idea. I, I, my son-in-law is in, in big data storage, and they're trying to put as much stuff in the cloud as possible. Yes, sir. The initial concerns were uh, clearance with CGIS uh, through the FBI, but that's uh, been settled over the last few years. And and sometimes with cloud, you can get them to pick up a little bit of that as you send it off. There. That was one of the costs. They do, they do some of the work for you. Exactly. One of the one of the concerns we had was weighing that increased cost versus a server-based option and taking the cost of IT personnel and the hardware, the server hardware, and okay. it became much more efficient long-term. And, okay. and I want to bring something up regarding that. And, and when you look at this holistically, and IT pushed from the onset to, to go cloud because it really reduces mm -hmm. their um, personnel requirements, and so I think that should be factored in. And the one thing I, I failed to mention it won't impact us this year because the, the funding needs to be put towards phasers. Um, but we've been asking for about $70,000 a year now, every year for since I got here for dash cams. That $70,000 now will be off the table um, and get diverted towards this program because of the triggers involved. Um, we don't feel that we need both. And so if somebody wanted to do the quick math, because I'm not the mathematician, <laughs> You could also remove that 70,000, not this next year, because we need to steer that in a different direction. Um, and I, I think I mentioned part of this is a lot of people, when they go to Axon, they go to Axon and Taser. Um, tasers are incredibly expensive. Um, our department doesn't utilize them a whole lot, but I need to have a less lethal device. We did find another option. It's about a third of the cost. and so. Um, we'll be using that funding that goes to the dash cam next year for that. Um, that's my desire. Uh, so again, you can take seventy thousand dollars in years two through five off that price tag as well, uh, and probably even more because you know every year they spike it up a little bit. So okay, but but not if you're going to put it into another program, like Kaiser's. 
No, the the phasers is a one-time buy, okay. um, and it's phasers, not the tasers. Um, we are not going the taser route with Axon. It was just to us simply cost prohibitive. We're going with a, a different option that we think. Okay. So that's year one, but years two through five, that seventy thousand should be diverted into the body camera program. Okay, that's good. Well, because that's at the end of the day, that's that's what this is definitely um, a uh, uh, it's a good it's a good conversation topic. And, and think something that we definitely need to look into and probably do. That's up to the board. But I, and I just wanted to say, I, this is this is a good thing. We're moving in the right direction. I just wanted to point out too that this is something that actually um, Councilman Sanders brought up uh, during the, uh, but sometime close to half a year ago, a year ago, when we were having the discussion, when a community was in here looking for, um, you know. Community oversight and all that stuff, but this was this was a council. I'm glad we're going here, but it was something that was brought up by council. So, and I'm I'm in support of it. So I just now we just got to figure out how to pay for it. Mr. Councilwoman Byron. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to make sure that I understand um, how these things operate. And I know with my mask, I'm hard to understand. I kind of sound like a Muppet, I've been told. So I'll take my mask off for this. Um, so our, let's, let's say our officers are in their vehicle, they're driving somewhere, and this, the speed of the vehicle is a trigger. Is that 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, a, an abrupt, like I'm cruising at 25 and now I'm going 50? I mean, what, where's the trigger on that, just so that I know? Do we know? Just whatever we determine. Yeah, you know, it's it's not determined at this time. Oh, okay. Um, we we our, have triggers now within our dash cameras for lights on, activation of lights. It triggers it. Um, impact triggers it. Um, I do speed triggers. We do speed audits. Um, so it's it's that's uh, dependent on what we decide. And when I say what we decide, it also plays into what the policy um, determines. You have. I'm sorry, you have some agencies that are still at a stalemate. Um, in fact, I think if you just look down at Sarasota, they've purchased the equipment and they can't get beyond the policy um, in negotiation with um, the police union. I feel like we've taken a very forward step with that. We worked with them. Um, I worked with them over a weekend uh, uh, with the union to get a T&E policy. Now, the T&E policy is a little bit different than this draft policy. This draft policy has not been approved yet, but we feel that we can get there. Um, their big issue is always not really what we record when the, the folks are working. It's the privacy issues. Um, you know, they don't want their, their folks being recorded when they're going to the bathrooms and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we think we'll be able to get there. None of us want that. I d yeah. <laughs> Just none of us want that. Um, so, ma'am, those triggers are in addition to the manual activation okay. that an officer is able to do. So um, if, if there's a crash with the vehicle, lights and sirens, speed, um, and any time someone draws their sidearm, it triggers the camera on and it triggers all of the cameras within a certain if we were all radius. Wearing, yes, if we were all wearing cameras right now and I drew my sidearm, for whatever reason, every camera would activate. Okay. Um, what is the reliability of these cameras? because all of us have seen TV shows where the officer got into a struggle with the bad guy and the camera got damaged and then they were accused of turning it off and yada, yada, yada. Um, what's, what's the reliability? We had no failures of the camera during our test evaluation product process. Uh, the camera will be mounted either firmly on an officer uh, through a bracket mount or a molly mount. If it's a molly mount, that's in the, the outer vest you see that are military style grade, um, they're not coming off. Uh, we had uh, normal situations, it's a point of, it's the point of view of the officer. So if I'm facing you right now, it's gonna be about this point of view. If I turn this way, it's gonna be that point of view and I'll get your audio, but it wouldn't be focused on you. It's about 130 degrees wide. Okay. And um, Councilwoman, this is not, and Council, this is not the cheapest option. I. I'm going to tell you, it, this is not the cheapest option. There were some cheaper options out there. I'm, I'm a pretty thrifty person. Um, you know, I like to start, you know, tell me why I can't have this version versus this version. Um, most will argue this is the best on the market. I 
tried every which way to make sure that we looked for other options, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we, and we reported back to you on what the officers chose. Well, the officers simply chose this because for the same reasons that the community would, that you would, um, it provided the best video in low light and in all light. It provided the best playback feature. It triggered other cameras. It did everything to prevent those oops that you see. Um, I can't, I can't, you know, comment on some of the issues we've seen nationwide. Um, all I can do is try to bring to you what I think will be pretty much foolproof. Um, so, well, to me, the public's trust is priceless, and I think it's important that we have quality equipment for the protection of our officers and for the protection of our citizens. Thank you. Councilman Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor uh, and uh, Council, I guess a uh, couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I've long been, uh, I guess, uh, in favor of body cams. Even back uh, in the very beginning, uh, you had some legal parameters as far as, uh, uh, you know, how uh, the tapes or the video uh, could be viewed and by whom and a lot of those things have been straightened out as well as uh, 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 before us was uh, financial and uh, it seems as though uh, at least for the you know to get the program underway it has been uh, solved uh, but I have uh, a couple questions uh, me I'm always uh, uh, looking at uh, it's not whether you have the equipment it's how are you going to use it? So I have uh, two questions, I guess, uh, I haven't really you know, heard uh, yet. It's, uh, first is um, a when. You know, uh, when are you looking to really uh, implement this program? And question number two, uh, it's always been a concern of mine, and it goes to how you use them, uh, the policies that are going to be set forth and um, uh, looking at, um, <coughs> you know, that they're properly used so that that trust will be there in the usage. Right, so um, the, uh, the time forward once we sign a contract is about eight weeks, although I think it's been coming into some agencies a little quicker. The, the only things that we're waiting for at this point are uh, funding, so funding and approval, and then we need to work through the, the policy. Um, again, I believe our t and &E policy was um, pretty strong. I know that there's some um, things within the permanent policy that are you know non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned and I think we'll get to that point but those are really just the the two issues that need to be um, addressed and we'll do that in tandem with um, you know procurement so I have a question mm -hmm. <clears throat> the uh, 70,000 a year for the dash cams I first heard you say that was five years, and then I heard you said two through five. Is it all five years? No, no. The, the year one, so <clears throat> we need to still buy phasers. Um, I think it's a, a better choice just because there are some issues with tasers being pretty close to phasers. I was going to buy phasers with forfeiture seizure, and then we were going to use the money and put towards the body cameras. I think it's a better decision from the legal fine print to take that 70 and buy the phasers so um, you'd only get four times 70 right about four times roughly four times 70 000. well four times 70 to 80 ish something because that price goes up a little right. bit every year so so i see this as two issues mm -hmm. one the dollars to fund it and then two the policy that backs it up and you know our discussions is that without good policy the cameras aren't well, we provided you a draft policy. Yes, and I've read that, and I think this is two separate issues, but I'm looking at the financial issue to begin with. So I'm sitting here calculating, and don't, these, are not, these are round numbers, but with what you just told me, we're probably looking at about $800,000 now from $1.2 million that I just uh, stated. So that's about, uh, divided by five is whatever, that's hundred. 150000 a year, roughly, if we're looking at it on an annual basis, what this would cost us. The round numbers, 150000 60000 a year. 
Is there any funding that you have? I know this is going to be a stupid question, but because you're going to say no, because I know you're already shaking your head. You know what the you know what the answer is before I get the question. Is there any way to supplement this through your your current budget? I um. Can we could, in other words, I guess I can. If we provided a hundred thousand dollars a year, could you absorb the rest of it? Um, I can't, and and you know if we go back uh, last year, we. And, and Mr. Callahan can comment on this. Our operating expense at the police department is lower than you would see in most agencies, and that is because we're very aggressive at buying the things we need uh, with forfeiture seizure money. We've um, we're, we're used to doing more with less. I think we're very effective, but there is simply no way unless you cut personnel, and that would be counter. Um, intuitive because we just added three bodies and um, our operating budget simply could not uh, take that impact and that's always been my concern that um, we we bring on this technology but we we lose somewhere else when we just we're, we can't lose anywhere else we, we really truly do um, and I'd be happy to provide a comparison to you and when you look at our operating expenses for the size agency we are we are bare bones. Um, not saying we don't have everything we need, we do. But we have everything we need and not anything more. Yeah, I would say, to, and to reflect upon that, um, when Chief brought this forward, I said a couple of things. One is make sure you include all the costs. Everybody needs to see all the costs that potentially could be there rather than trying to present something that looks like it is oh, it's affordable or whatever else, and then you come back later and need more things. And we didn't want to present that. We wanted to present everything up front as what should be or could be the actual cost with this. And then looking at this is a long-term commitment from city council. It's not a long-term commitment from the police department. Is this something the city council believes that is important to move forward with based on the community needs, based on the things that are out there currently expected of police departments? And then it becomes the responsibility of council to figure out if they want to fund that. And I believe the answer is yes. How are we going to specifically come up with $50,000 here, $50,000? That will all have to be figured out over time. Melanie has worked through things for the initial year, knowing we just went through the budget process, saying how can we soft, potentially soften the blow the first year. But the reality is in year two through five, you're going to be, for the most part, at full cost. Now, we've, we've looked at the, the, the dash cam issues to be able to, to save some monies. But I think it's a, it's a commitment that ultimately council needs to make, saying, yes, we have to fund it. When we get into the budget process, know that it's included in the budget process. And then all the things that come into play over all the departments, how do we figure out where your priorities sit? in order to make sure that the fundings are there. And that's what any budget should reflect, or what are the priorities of council, what are the priorities of the community. And I think this has jumped upon us as an extreme priority, where over years in the past it had not been a priority. It had kind of been one of those things, yeah, we kind of like to do it. But I think the, the transformation over the last couple of years has shown that that's probably not the case anymore. Thanks, Bert. Yes, uh, I guess as far as uh, funding, uh, we, we can't afford not to fund this. Uh, you know, I uh, honestly, uh, you know, with uh, things that are, you know, going on uh, nationally, state level, local, uh, you, you have to, you know, at some time say, you know, this is, this is worthwhile. And uh, I don't want to, you know, get into a lot of the things of everybody talking about defunding and all this and that. We can't. We can't afford not to fund uh, the body cams uh, here in the city of Bradenton at this point. And that's, that's my view. Thank you, Mr. Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first off, I, I'd like to say I, I, I am not prepared to vote on this today, but this is definitely something that I I'm, you know, want to keep working towards. I think it's worth pursuing. Um, I, and I want to point out as we're talking about expense, and, and I mean, we knew it was going to be expensive. I remember when Mr. Sanders brought it up just uh, uh, whenever that was, let's just say, nine months ago, that um, uh, the initial, without any research, I think what we were quoted about 300, I think it was around, we hadn't done any research, and you said it's very expensive, around $350,000 coming in, and that much per year annually. So we've already come way down on, on where, you're, where you've done where the, with the research. And so, you know, this is, and so now, and, and I, I, although it's a million dollars over five years, I need to break it down into annual budgets and where we can figure out how to how to make that work because otherwise a million dollars is just too much money 
but if I break it down into year by year, we'll figure out how to do that. And I think with Mr. What Mr. Bird said is that you know not only not only does is this something that it's appropriate at this time for the community. I think it is for the officers as well that that you know if there's an argument of uh, you know after an incident, someone says, well, he did this, she did that, and everything. If we have a body camera, it might it might point out that the officer actually did the right thing. And and we've actually uh, was it two or three? We had two of those incidents, uh, two complaints against two different officers. While they were um, those particular officers were teeing the cameras. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. One and um, I, it was great. We invited the complainant to come down and view it, and I was able to to pull it up right there and view it, and it was a, a whole different scenario. And so, I agree with you. I think yeah. the officers initially were like, you know, whoa, what's going on here? And I will tell you now, uh, they are embracing it and they're asking for it. Uh, that was my question. I, 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 I was I, let me let me finish up. And and, and on that note, I remember when. Uh, <coughs> when we had red light cameras and my daughter got a, a red light camera for a right hand turn and she argued that it <laughs> she stopped and I watched it and it's like no honey you did a California turn <laughs> uh, a couple more uh, <clears throat> that was a question you answered it is some some of some police forces are opposed to it you say yours you you to, you know, I went and asked them, and they're for it because it, it works, can work both ways. You know, to defend your integrity, uh, that's good to hear. <clears throat> Another f financial side of it, um, we, we have, uh, and I'm not picking on this, so don't take it wrong. Um, we have a 911 service, and th that's a pretty expensive operation. Do you feel we have duplication because of the county doing the same thing? Um, not at all. Uh, if you really go and look at the, the county's operation, um, you know, they, they actually um, provide dispatch services for the sheriff's office, but that's a whole separate section. There, there's still bodies that need to, to do that. Um, we actually have, you know, we always build in redundancy. Our secondary site for our operations is over at the county. Um, and remember, our 911, well, it's not our 911, but our comm center um, dispatches for both police and fire. Um, you, you never, as an agency our size, want to give that up uh, because of, um, well, I'm not going yeah, to get up here and talk about their service level versus our service level, but it's important to, to be able to have that um, combined so you know it really speaks to um, response times answering call times um, having that control over that service is incredibly important for a city our size you don't really see um, so I mean we can have a, a discussion about that offline and, and we have had that discussion for many, many at years. least a decade and so we evaluate it on a regular basis not just and I know you know, the when something like this comes up new it's just never really worked for everyone. Well, that, it, it, is that number, yeah. I, I haven't crunched them, the numbers on it, but that's roughly uh, probably a million dollars a year, isn't it? Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. And I know the fire department would probably want to opine on this too because they, they feel pretty strongly about it as well, particularly when you look at their response times versus um, county response times, but I'll, I'll shut up there. Okay. So, um, I took it as a two-part um, thing. Can we afford it? And like Mr. Bird says, we can't not afford it. So you know I'm for it. I don't want to, want to vote on it today. I think like anything, we need to take some time and look at it and see if there's a way. If you divide it down, it's roughly $160,000 a year. That makes it, that softens the blow a little bit, but comes up still about $800,000 over a five-year period, even with your $150,000 contribution the first year. So with that said, I, I'd be in favor of it. Now I've always said that the, the cameras are one, only one part of it. The policy is the other part, and there's a number of questions that I'd ask the rest of the council, Mary and Barmy, uh, Ms. Barmy, started asking those questions, and, and we want to make sure that the integrity is there 
and uh, I've highlighted and got a number of questions that if we have time or if somebody else wants to start the conversation about the policy that we have and I've read your read your policy and uh, for the most part it's it's pretty good but as there is some questions of you know activation and and the, the ability to uh, this is a, this is a work in progress. This work in progress. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I don't think we're ready well, for that. The, <clears throat> what you what the draft policy is is something now that we're going to need to present to the police union uh, because at the end of the day, it's it's a negotiation. It's impact bargaining. It's negotiation, and we try to come up with what we feel best serves our community, yet um, provides them you know privacy. Um, whatnot. I'm sure that you know there's there's all kinds. I tell you all all the time. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's sample policies all over the place. But when it comes to something like this, you know, I would probably try to argue um, maybe something a little bit different than you know agency X. I don't know. Um, I I have a pretty good idea of what I think is important for us. I've seen everything you see on television. I don't want us to ever be caught in a position where something just wasn't captured. That is why, that's one of the reasons why we have um, selected this particular device because it, it kind of takes the oops out of it um, with the different triggers, with the different activations. If, if one person activates, um, you know, whether you like it or not, your camera's gonna activate. And so there's a lot built into this camera that we don't need to try to Put in a policy because it, it is what it is it's whether you know whether the officer agrees or not it's you know there's going to be some certain built-in activation so um uh the, the high profile case we have before us now is of course in louisville kentucky where cameras were turned off on a no-knock warrant is that something that could happen here I mean, if you go with the no-knock warrant, you, you automatically turn the cameras off, or, or why were they off? Well, first I don't off, know, we don't, I don't, know we don't do no, we don't do no-knock warrants in, we don't in do the that, city. So that's not a, that wouldn't that wouldn't. Ha but there's there's uh, what, what's the uh, I, I read yeah, that, what's so, the policy for turning off the camera? Um, I so a lot of times I and again you're I'm not going to try to worry about what those departments' policies are. What I will tell you is that. Um, that my uniformed officers, when they're out doing uniform policing, engaging in search warrants, engaging in community contacts, engaging in arrest, will have their cameras on. Um, period. So. Patrick? Yeah, so, um, so as I said before, this is, I, I think this is great that we're here. Um, it's less expensive than we were initially, you know, thought it might be. Uh, we're still in last year's budget right now. That we'll be starting this up. We just approved a budget where this wasn't included, so we'll have to figure out how to make it work. So I think that we have a little bit of time here. I, I, I don't want to, uh, at this point in time, race into a million dollar commitment when these, these are all great questions. We're, we're going to have to have this discussion and figure this out, and I think we could do it in a timely manner, but uh, I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, I don't wanna make it a knee-jerk reaction, it's not, not, and you're not proposing that, I don't think, so that let's just, let's just move forward on this with due diligence. This is, you know, um, but I'm not ready to act this second. Please let Mr. Bird go. Yeah. I, you know, I just wanted to comment on, uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, uh, but, um, and, and that's why I said when, and I asked the question when earlier, uh, because uh, every day uh, that uh, we don't have the body cams, in my opinion, uh, it's not really good for anybody uh, as far as uh, the officers that are uh, saying that they would like to have them, uh, as well as uh, uh, the, uh, the community. So, you know, you don't, I agree, you don't want to move too fast, but, you know, we need to also think in terms of saying, hey, you know, we need to, you know, uh, move uh, uh, in, a, in a fashion that would be good for our city. Right. I think Ms. Callahan wants to weigh in on that point. Yeah, just to, from, a, from a perspective of 
<clears throat> funding and, and from what Mr. Roth said, no, we did not include this in the budget. But there are things in the budget which we could move around to be able to afford this, okay? And, and the, particularly year one. That's why I'm saying year one is, is, an, is not as much of an issue necessarily as years two through four. If, if you recall, one of the things that I did put in the budget in sales tax is public safety vehicles. We currently do not have any public safety vehicles slotted to use that money. We could, during the course of this year, take a couple of the vehicles out of, out of the line item 630s and, and say, okay, well, we're not going to do that. We'll put those in the sales tax dollars and free up the police department budget for some of these funds. Those are all things that are available without saying you're permanently changing stuff, you're manipulating stuff. It's all the option to be able to do that. That's why certain things are left as not determined on a permanent basis because that we've committed to over the years to make sure that the, the public safety has all the equipment they needed through the sales tax. But the equipment that you need there through sales tax is only vehicles. It's not other types of things. So that's where you, could, you can start moving things around if necessary, particularly coming out of a budget that we just approved knowing that you know you don't want to start it and start right up in the new year saying okay we're in a deficit so how do we handle that those are things that the chief when she starts narrowing down these costs really close in the next so that we can move forward with an answer i mean i think the thing is i want answers how are we going to pay for it we will provide answers as exactly how it's going to be paid for and i think we can do that in short order so that you can move forward with a decision if that is one of the stumbling blocks to say how how can we do this we'll we'll provide that in, in short order well, where is the public safety vehicles it's in the sales tax budget but under whose budget under what department under, under half cent sales tax okay. Okay. general it's under it is in, in general the 302 general. the 302 there is a four hundred thousand dollar line item in safe public safety vehicles it, and it's been carried over it is reestablished every year, not carried over, we, because we spent it last year. It's, re, it's carried over. What did we spend it on last year? A fire, two fire trucks, or a fire truck. Yeah, the small trucks. So yeah, so that is free and available this year, <coughs> should we need it for just this type of situation. Okay. Or if we wanted to say, let's go get one more of those trucks. But I think what we do is we try to accumulate those funds because not every not every fire truck we have can be one of these smaller attack trucks. There are points in time when we need pumpers, which are twice the cost. Mm -hmm. So you accumulate funds in some over some periods of time to be able to do that. Or you, <coughs> you allocate more money that particular year to be able to acquire something like that. Our, as was indicated, uh, by the chief, by both chiefs, our operating costs in these departments are pretty narrow, and and, and like we say, 13 percent of the costs of these departments are non-personnel. So when you when you look at the opportunities to use the sales taxes, where you can take these other types of items and make sure that things get done on a timely basis, that was the beauty of the sales tax. If we didn't have the sales tax, we would be hard pressed to come up with some of these things. But we do have it. It was a commitment we made during the process for public to make sure public safety vehicles are switched out. We can still do that. That's that's, that's it. There's just options. I don't want to rely on that long term. But this first year was kind of we're right at the end of a budget period. So how do we do it? We we can help you figure that out that's that's that, that's a, with certainty councilwoman Barnard. thank you mr mayor i believe our citizens have asked for this i believe it will assist our officers in establishing and maintaining trust in the community and i would like to see this done as soon as possible so I'm asking that we get that information on how it, how it can be paid, you know, how we're going to pay for it. And do you all believe it'd be possible to have it by our next council meeting? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Well, that's when I would request that it be brought back because we've talked about it. I, I, I think, and I haven't been here, but I know it's been talked about in the community and I think it's been talked to death. We're getting close to necrotized equine abuse. So I think we need to take action, and I think we know what we need to do. Mr. Roth? Yeah, so um, one of the things we got hung up on last year was um, the 
police uh, uh, union contract where we had approved the uh, higher command and then the lower command, so we wound up having to commit to, um, the, it's, uh, we went full three year com a commitment knowing that we were, that the two years were uncertain and there was discussion at that point in time as to whether we do a one year commitment or a three year commitment. We did the right thing because we wanted to stick, stay in line with the higher command. So my point being that sometimes union negotiations go off track. You said that your union had tentatively approved a T and E on this, whatever that means, but where, where, what would it take for the union to sign off on this? The, no, we work closely with the union for the T and E policy. Um, the T and E policy is a little bit different. Um, it provided because this was unknown um, equipment for us, for example, um, uh, if an officer got out of his car and didn't turn it on, um, well, all the triggers weren't existing because we didn't have other people with cameras. We were saying, okay, mm -hmm. we're not looking to him anybody up right now. We're looking to just get the data. And so the T and E had to be crafted that way. What this is, what the draft here is, is something that we're simply going to send to the union and, and begin engaging in that discussion. And I know exactly what they're going to be looking for. It's privacy issues. Um, as an example, the uh, the watch guard camera, something that I initially thought, well, I, I think this would be some some um, a great idea because it records quietly 24-7. You really can never shut it off. That attracted me at first until people started saying, uh, it never goes off, it, not even when you're going to the bathroom, not even when you're eating, not when you're calling your wife, not when you're on your lunch break, it never goes off. Um, it, you know, I kind of, that hit me with a, a big sledgehammer. Well, you know, they're never gonna agree to that and I'm not even gonna agree to that. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the kind of things they're looking at. We have a very good relationship with them. We talk frequently. I'm confident that we're gonna be able to work through any issues. We're gonna, based on you all, um, you know, expressing that you want to move forward, we're going to be sending this policy over to them probably today or tomorrow and say let's, um, and it's usually a, a negotiation between myself, Mr. Driscoll, um, Mick McHale, and his attorney, and we start trying to get through the weeds and make sure that um, this is palatable. But I, I, think, I think you guys maybe, or I'm not sure, this isn't going to be anything. Um, we all know what the camera should do, what they need to do, and they're going to do it at the end of the day, so. Okay, so, so just so everyone's clear on where, and I didn't say I was wanted to drag my feet on this or anything like that, that this is something I, I, I do agree with and I do want to move forward with, but this is the devil's in the detail kind of deal. I don't want us to figure out how to implement a program and come up, figure out how to fund a program and then move forward on a program and then have a union come in and tell me that, uh, by the way, we're not doing it your way, we're doing it my way. I, I'm, that's not the way, I, I, I work with the union to, to come up with a policy that everyone agrees on, and we do it all at the same time. Which is why we sent, but most agencies don't do that, Sarasota bought their cameras and then they worried about a policy. Right. We've been doing it all along, mm -hmm. um, because it's important when you're writing the policy to know what equipment specifically you're signing off on. It's, it's um, you know, right. So, so, that, so, so you, you get my point. I just wanted to make sure everyone right. understands that this is that's 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 a very important detail. Oh, absolutely, well, just, absolutely. Just as important as me figuring out how to pay for it is that we know that when we get to the to the ninety nine percentile, that you know that the union doesn't come in and say, nah, we're we're really not okay with the way you want to do it. We want to do it our way. Well, if we if we're going to come up with the the tough job of figuring out how to pay for it, I want to make sure that the union's on board with it um, just as a comment to that we have a very good working relationship with the police union and the fire union uh, and public works not so much because very few questions come up there but we have a great working relationship it's not a TV it's not a television relationship that you see where, where there's a mean tough guy the union guy Telling you what to do. That is the way it works. Mr. Here. Mayor, I, I, I respect that comment, but I know that every single PD union, union negotiation I've been in on since in my 15 years has not been a very smooth, um, you know, we, it takes a while to get the contract done. I mean, we were, 
we were, uh, you know, we were at impasse at one point with PD, and and you know, and and we had a we had a snafu in the last union contract. I just got done with that, so I'm not saying it's 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 horrible, but it's certainly not kumbaya-ish. So it, there's there's some it's it's in between there is where I just want to make sure, having just done this, that that we you know, look when the city council committed to a three-year. Uh, after after Corona showed up, you know, we went out on a limb for PD to, to because the uh, because the, um, the 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 rank and file drop you know slowed down on that. So I, I just want to make sure we don't get caught up in that again. I'm just trying to give you some assurance that it's I, not I, as dramatically bad as in lots and lots of places. I'm certainly willing to, um, as as I anticipated, with some approval, that um, you all agree that um, none of those other cameras suits our needs, that Axon suits our need needs. Um, I'm going to ship that policy off today, and we'll begin discussing it. Um, the T&E took us about two weeks to get through, um, and so I, you know, I don't want to necessarily stop everything and, and get that done. I think it's uh, working um, in conjunction with each other so that it's it's moving along. Um, so. Yes, uh, just a statement. Uh, I'm glad we're uh, and uh, councils decided to try to move forward for the next meeting uh, on, on making a, a determination. And uh, one of the words uh, I always use, I uh, use a lot, uh, uh, betterment. Uh, I just have to say that this is going to be for the betterment of this city uh, as we uh, move forward, and you know that's that's my opinion on where we're at with this. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, you have a, a the T and E. What's the acronym for what? Test and evaluation. Test and evaluation. <laughs> I'll probably forget that. Um, you you'll give us plenty of time to see that review once you send, hence send this to the union, right? I mean, I, I know you don't know, do you, do you have a timeline or anything, that, how fast they would mean, review that and get back to us on the policy? No, no, the test and evaluation policy was already I, I, yeah, I know that, but I, I, I'm, I, that was too quick. You're saying a right? final policy? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to ship it off to them today yeah. and, and we'll begin uh, negotiations. I don't know, we're, you know, we're kind of bound by their timeline, our timeline, we're, we're pretty quick and uh, okay. Usually, if they know we're we're pushing it, but they they're also dealing with what ten other agencies trying to do the same thing. So I, I understand. So so I would like for us to see that my personal I'd like for us to see that uh, prior to crunching numbers. I think policy is more important than the the numbers, even though it's we're both important. But I'd like to see that first. My personal opinion, and and make sure that we're all understanding that the policy of the body cameras is is important so, so we're going to hold off on numbers or what we can what's go ahead and direct? crunch the numbers i don't have a problem with that but 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 we, we i don't want that to override the policy okay uh, policy I'm, that's a personal opinion policy is number one if policy isn't agreeable on I'm not willing to right we're going to have a, a policy um I, an acceptable, I'm start acceptable policy is the, uh, that's the language i want to use acceptable policy to our council well, for the community yeah i good for everyone my, let me i would like to I, i'm pretty strong you know i also uh, uh, sort of agree as far as the policy side but there are things that we could do at the next meeting i mean the, the numbers looking at the numbers and uh, the only thing I, I look at is saying uh, you know before you're going we're going to sign off on a lease of some type uh, uh, for the equipment then uh, maybe you know we should have uh, something on the policy but that as far as the next meeting I, I think the, the numbers and some of those things we should have uh, we uh, should be fine remember we have three weeks before the next meeting we're not right. two weeks this is a three week okay. jump okay. too so okay. so but that's you know I, I I say we we keep trying to move forward. But I I, I think I think the policy is important. But uh, I I think that um, we shouldn't you know just all just waiting on you know that uh, uh, that policy side of because sometimes that can be you know kind of drawn out. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you.
Carl, a uh, correction. Uh, you said we get three weeks before a meeting? I'm, I'm looking at two. The 30th is next Four. Wednesday. I think the 7th is the first Wednesday, and the second Wednesday would then be the 14th. 14th, October 14th. And look at September and October. Yes. Okay. Ms. Beauchamp? Uh, we have the no unfinished business. business. No, sir. Council reports? Councilman Barnaby? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this Monday's MPO meeting, um, Councilman Sanders and myself had a, a very interesting presentation done on the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization Long Range Plan, which goes out to the year 2045. Um, I'm not sure I will be operating a vehicle at that point. <laughs> But it's good to know that they're, they're planning for that. And they have a, a condensed version of that presentation. And I would like to know if the council members would like to see that at an October meeting. Just to talk about, because um, this, for me, this was the first time I thought the MPO was looking at things holistically. It, in the past, it's always been about you know, more asphalt and more buses. But now they're talking about looking at things in a holistic fashion and talking about preserving the environmental health and improving it, as well as using transportation to help create vibrant spaces, which is something that, you know, here in Bradenton, we have been working on for many, many years. And uh, the, our, our presentation would include information about um, what are the high crash locations in the city of Bradenton and how is that going to be affected as we move forward. Um, one of the other things is looking at roadways that would uh, incorporate automated cars, driverless cars, I'm not sure what the autonomous, autonomous cars I guess is the the buzzword which quite frankly I don't know which is scarier a new teenage driver or, or an autonomous car but um, I I think it could be interesting, and Mr. Sanders agreed with me, so we're asking council if they would like to see something like that. I would. I'd love to see. Yeah, that it. sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So condensed version. The yeah. the con uh, absolutely the condensed version. Um, right, and there was a lot of stuff that I, I didn't <clears throat> hear till that MPO meeting about Bradenton itself, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought, well, I don't, I'm not even aware of this. It, it'd be good for everybody to hear it at the same time because it. You know, we don't want to know what's happening not in our community. They can condense it down to what affects us, and I think it's uh, it could be a very good presentation. I was I was pretty impressed with it, and that's you know. So, um, how would you like us to proceed? Would Mr. Callahan do you first available with them? Hopefully, I think the best would if we could make it the last meeting in October. But well, well here's the problem that, that <clears throat> this is going to get presented for, presented by October, I think, 20th for final. And so we wouldn't have any input if we wait till that long. Oh, okay. And we so I, I would think we would want input before the final draft is, I mean, it's going to, here it is, live with it. And I, I think we need to see that. Well, you said the next meeting is the 14th, right? right? So we only have one chance if we want to make any changes or, or give our opinion. Well, we will reach out to them and tell them our preference would be the 14th because we'd like to see it before the final Right. Any, any adoption. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, a couple of other things. I had um, the opportunity to speak with a citizen that had interaction with our fire department for a medical emergency, and he was extremely complimentary of how quickly our, our EMTs arrived, their professionalism. Um, nothing bad to say he was he was very happy that they were able to come in and there was a good outcome so thank you very much for that uh, nationally we have seen the passing of a of a legal giant in Ruth Bader Ginsburg and um, as a woman if you have a credit card in your name you need to thank her if you've been able to buy a house, you need to thank her. 
there's a lot of issues affecting women and when you have women's issues are family issues so I, I wanted to make sure that uh, I brought that up as well as the passing of Jeannie Oliver who was the executive director of the Manatee County Girls Club I was lucky enough to know her I was lucky enough to be one of her employees and I was lucky enough to call her my friend thank you mr. mayor Ms. Ralph. yeah thank you mr. mayor and um, thank you councilman Barmody for your comments and because I, I what what I took to note was um, as we had the speakers um, address us today uh, one of the one of the speakers represented it was I thought it was girls club um, made the comment that uh, many of the families are um, single family which we probably assume is a single mother living on twenty thousand dollars a year if that's even just one child and a mom I have no idea how people do that I, I just that just is is mind-blowing that that there are people that uh, you know are, are, are sustaining themselves on on such a small amount of money so I think you're right with recognizing that and also that we have a long way to go um, and then uh, as far as Ward 3 goes I'm very happy to report that the um, uh, Ballard lots that we all worked together on that was the uh, <laughs> the uh, John the, 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 the Neil the Neil purchase which became uh, the Neil Park and then the eight lots that were uh, put off to uh, public notice for development by a developer who uh, came and did a presentation for uh, modular housing which is not mobile homes it's uh, it's pre-built factory built built on a uh, really standardized construction put on a, a foundation they're laying foundation today for the first home in there and I think that that's going to be the first of eight um, uh, I know this individual has successfully built some homes that are in the in our community um, and uh, done well and I think that these homes are going to go uh, very they're going to be very effective in, in, in rejuvenating that neighborhood which is in the 14th Street CRA this is going to turn into one of our I believe down the road we'll look back and say this is one of our more successful projects that we've done um, especially when he finishes it off and, and puts in the last two which will be on the waterfront so that project is uh, under construction as we speak and it's been a long time coming and uh, I'd like to thank the council for uh, the support to get us to this point and that'll conclude my report mr. mayor Sanders. thank you mr. mayor uh, <clears throat> yes um, councilman Roth uh, he has eight in your area and he has three in my area and one of them is already up and I suggest anybody would like to look at it go by and look at it it's they go up fast a month you know and they're so you have you know it's not like a, a construction where you have a lot going on out in the streets and so forth so it's it's uh, you know I'm I was impressed with it I thought at first it was you know modular then you know well what are we going to get but I, I think it's a very good home so there's, there's going to be three of them in, in my ward and one of them is already there for sale <clears throat> um, since we got some time and I know the calendar is running pretty short with other stuff presentations I'd like to have any kind of update we might have on our East Riverwalk extension and the Second Avenue extension and I've mentioned this to uh, Jeanette at Realize Braden that <clears throat> I feel that's a big part of that Riverwalk is that Second Avenue connection over to Braden Castle so is there any information that you might have today or when we get more information on this as we proceed are we are we are we you know we had 60 percent plans are we any closer to getting 90 percent where, where are we where are we at because I think we've yeah they're getting closer to 90 percent what I did get from uh, the selected vendor was an estimate of costs based on the 60 percent drawings which is on phase one only okay it's not on the second phases and what we're seeing is just preliminarily the cost coming in more than we thought which is not unusual because somebody throwing out a number which we threw out seven million dollars was based on not much um, so I started to reconcile that versus what we thought we had budget allowances and I'll be presenting that to you just as a hey here we kind of are but at 60% drawings it still doesn't it's not enough to give a GMP 
because you really got to get up at your 90% drawings before somebody can give you a, a, a GMP to give you an actual cost. But I did get those. I do have um, both of their contracts without a GMP to look through, which I'll be sending off to the attorneys. Just matter of fact, just got that yesterday, which includes pre-development costs, which is not much. It's a half of a percent. And, and then, excuse me, um, their general conditions contracts, which are both standard AIA contracts, but I'll get those off the attorney just to start looking at it. It doesn't include the numbers yet, but the numbers will be a drop in play as long as the contract is fine. Um, so we'll be doing that. But the reconciliation of where costs are versus where we, we thought up front is a little interesting because I think at that point we'll want to come back and decide how do we really want to bite this off. We know that the first two phases are certain. The third phase is a bit more interesting, which is the piece in front between the hospital and Tarpon Point. Um, I, I get concerned about that phase a little bit because the primary way I'm sure construction will be coming into the site whenever Tarpon Point goes will be down Riverside. Right. Well, you don't want to tear it up, but if Tarpon Point doesn't develop for years and years and years, you don't want to wait on something not being done either. So those are some considerations when we get to that piece. And then I, I don't think it's anybody's desire to link up through Manatee Avenue. So to, to look at those costs may be something to hold off on until we figure out the third avenue. But it's, that's the reconciliation I'm trying to go through to say where are we relative to costs and, and how do we get there and what would be the funding sources if we decided to go all in, what would be the funding sources. So got those uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm working on that. I worked on it yesterday, and, and I'll be finalizing that to get to you. On, that's on the extension. Not the extension. That's on Riverwalk. So. Okay. And, and what about the extension, the second avenue? Well, I, I think you're referring to the third avenue extension. Third second avenue, avenue is, is a complete street project, the two right. different That's things. That's what I know. I'm referring to the second avenue street mm -hmm. project. Okay. Well. No, not, not the cut, sir. Okay. The second avenue project, we have a conceptual design that has been presented to us by our consultants. We have asked them, as I think I've indicated to you before, is I can, I'd be happy to provide it to you, but it's not going to show you much because yeah. it's just ink on a drawing. I want that on an aerial. They're still in the process of putting that together for us. As soon as I get it, I will be happy to have that sent to you all for review, and then we'll have a discussion at a council or a workshop meeting to discuss, are you okay with the concept of what they're proposing? And you think that'll be? I, I would not think that I would, I, I would think that I would have it available for us to have at the next council meeting. And I will be pushing them for that because I've been pushing them up to this point and have gotten nothing back, right. per se. All right, thank you. Would that be in a condensed, condensed version? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I've got a set of drawings that's probably 70 drawings of, of a preliminary design. I wouldn't make anybody look at that. What I want is <laughs> some aerial photographs that show the layout, that show how the roadway is laid in conjunction with the tree canopy, what impacts it may or may not have on where we would have to take out trees and things of that nature because th it's a beautifully canopied road as it is now and I'm trying to make sure that everybody is on board with what is being proposed. I'm just reminding you, we'll be putting you on at the same time with FDOT. <laughs> I understood. <laughs> understood. And, and by the way, Jim, you sent us a good <clears throat> uh, email yesterday about the lane change and at 27th Street, which I think is 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 pretty fast. I'm ecstatic. Have now, you ever seen one on. that fast? Uh, well, uh, hold on. I know. Hold on, because the, the the main component that they're looking at right now, when they say they're talking about structural is to make sure that the mast arms have the ability to hold in the additional signals and signage. You would think that that is relatively simple, but they have a very distinct process, and for a reason, uh, to go through that process. But based upon what I see so far, it's all, it's all good. And I'm, I'm on board with what they recommended as well about eliminating the U-turn, because that makes that right turn flow much better much better and, and he said there was another u-turn on up by the the um, by the car wash car wash on yep. the other side that, that that could 
be utilized. So and or at 28th Street. Yeah, it, it so looked either one of those would work And at our Hill meeting, at the F dot <coughs> thumbs up on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I, I'm with you. I'm yeah. happy that they moved and, this and the county they is looking at it too. Yes, because they, they they've got the word that that they need to do something with the rest of the roadway. This is a temporary fix. Correct. And you know the last component of the email was that they've asked us a question as to whether or not we would be able to affect the timing and do the skip lines in the roadway. I'll be getting back to them today to let them know that that's a go. Um, so they'll provide us with the signals and the equipment. And we have to install it and time it. So I think it's all all working pretty well so far. Good. Thank, thanks for your help on that because that was Mr. Mayor. I've heard that for a long time. I, I wanted to make a couple comments. I, it's, it, sometimes it, it hurts to be last in line here, but uh, I, w I was going to make mention and uh, ask the, I guess, uh, update. I received the uh, email on 27th Street uh, East also, and um, uh, just trying to find out as far as a time frame. I saw the, the email, and I was just going to, you know, if, if we were to go forward with this, because uh, if, as you can remember, uh, uh, you had some residents that were really concerned with the, the cut throughs and a lot of the traffic and this could be something short term and I've been in conversation with the county commissioner that, that represents that area too. Well uh, again the, the unknown I have right now is waiting on the structural analysis from DOT for the master. If that passes their muster and they give us the go it's just a matter of how fast they can get us the equipment. So the installation of and, and making it happen is a relatively simple process once it happens. So, thank you. Uh, and just one, la and because you mentioned tree canopy, do we have anything with our, our tree board uh, about anything in the city? I don't think we do about protecting tree canopies in certain neighborhoods if they're in the rights of way. Uh, Braden River Lakes reached out to me yesterday uh, about protection of tree canopies back, and if you've been through there, it is a beautiful tree canopy area and they would like some assurance some way some form of that's protected and I said well if the, is the canopy in private private property or is it in they it, and I was told it was in <clears throat> on public right-of-way with the city but other communities I believe has been quoted that that they have some protections that that is all of a sudden you look at and the trees not been cut down well there is a master plan um, I I'd have to review it to see exactly how, how much protection is provided, but um, this was finalized, I want to say six or seven years ago that the plan was finalized through the tree board to, uh, for, for that very thing. And it, that was all over the city? Yes. So, so if you could you yeah. know, get me that or- I'll get you a copy or, of or that. So that, because I think all those neighborhood areas, it's a nice neighborhood that they're a little concerned and he was a spokesman for him that he's concerned that that there is no protection for that well i can only tell you that from from the from our standpoint as far as tree trimming and what we do is only to provide for right safe passage of right. emergency vehicles and things of that nature so we're not unless a tree dies that, that's what i told him that i don't think you're going to have any worries but uh, they're getting this from another community that that, that there's tree protection for that canopy type stuff. Okay, I'll get you a copy of the plan. Those are mostly live oaks in there, and yeah. they are they are protected. Yeah, I know. I know that. I said any any time they somebody would do that, they'd have to get a permit, and they probably wouldn't get one on those trees right. from from my visibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Burke. A lot of years I've been Ward Five. You're always last, so all the news is over by the time you get here. <laughs> But uh, I do have one uh, small item, if you notice, in the, uh, I guess, the council corner. And uh, uh, I, I have to say uh, some of the, the dollars. I know we, uh, back when we were looking at infrastructure, uh, um, trying to, you know, pass and get some uh, sales tax dollars uh, and to do infrastructure. Uh, this is one of the things that I tried to focus in on. But the, uh, the water, uh, water main and drainage, uh, uh, construction that's getting started over there and uh, near the East Bradenton Park. Uh, you have that. Uh, it's going to be going at, uh, at the same time. Uh, you probably notice that um, the 15th Street East the sidewalk project uh, that's through the county is going to be going on. So uh, the Public Works, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, they went door to door and uh, let the residents know. 
uh, that uh, for the next few months uh, that's going to be going on it's going to be you know a lot of a lot of work going on and um, so we we uh, we like to say uh, those your, your tax dollars uh, going going to work and uh, uh, that's um, uh, it's going to be a probably a lot of uh, uh, I guess comments coming from the residents because uh, it, it's going to be a lot of work in that little area there. But I uh, wanted to make sure that we made mention, uh, you know, uh, under our business and uh, those that didn't get the notice or didn't um, uh, read it in the uh, newsletter uh, that uh, it's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of construction uh, going on in the area. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a great project uh, when, it, when it finishes up. Okay, nothing else? Good. Um, we had a lot of good conversation today, a lot of good information. Um, and the one thing that I've always said as, as mayor and still believe today is public safety is the only reason for local government. And we had a lot of different conversations, both police, fire, and, and public works, all working to make sure our citizens are safe and Ms. Barnaby made that point I think as well. So that's what I have. Ms. Beauchamp, you have anything for us? Yes, briefly, yes. Um, I want to let you know that you'll see us promoting in your water bills in a couple of weeks that we're going to start accepting utility bill payments at every Walmart, which is kind of a coup for us. We're really excited about it. Um, this is something that's been facilitated by Paymentus, who's our payment processor. Um, they will charge a $2 fee to, to pay, make your payment there at the Walmart, but this is going to open a lot of accessibility for our customers and, again, work toward us trying to keep more folks out of our, our front work area and have them pay things remotely, which is, which is a good thing right now for us. So just want to let you know you'll be seeing that. And that's good work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Jim, you have anything else? Chief? Chief, have anything else? Scott, have anything for us? Ms. Callahan. Yes, I have one thing. As you're aware, I think we brought forward before that um, last year the legislature changed the rules on our affordable housing committee, and there was a necessity to appoint a, a, a sitting member of council to that, to that uh, committee. I'd send out an email seeing if who might be interested in that. I did get a couple of responses. I've talked to those folks, you know, after that response, and I thank them for, for showing the willingness to serve. I think at this time, um, Mr. Sanders, if you're still willing to serve, I'd like a motion from City Council to appoint Mr. Sanders to the Affordable Housing Committee. Motion to approve Mr. Sanders to the Affordable Housing Committee. Second. <laughs> well, he's one that stepped up first. He jumped in first. That's I would have did it for two months. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, I, I appreciated immediate responses. Ms. Barnaby responded, and with that, it was like, okay. And, and I talked to her, and she said, no, if he actually wants to do it, that's, that's fine. So Perfect. that's kind of um, where we are, at least to get going. Hey, something changes in the board in next year. That's up to that's up to y'all. But at least get us going because there is a little bit of uh, education requirement associated with that. He only has to have a uh, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't in that email. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. No, there's there's nothing. It's just getting up to speed, and, and we'll work with Vicky to make sure he gets announcements as to when the meetings are. Perfect. If I can get a a. a we have, a, we have a motion. I don't. Did I get a second? Yeah, I, I second it. Okay, yeah. we're ready. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? You, no. you don't want me to do a public hearing, do you? <laughs> 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 hearing none. Let's vote. Ward four. Did I get to vote on this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Five. Yes. Two. Yes. Three. Yes. Thank you. You've been drafted. Votes four to zero. Been drafted. Unanimous. At least, at least I'll yeah, get thank you all for that. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything for good of the order? Hearing none. Stand adjourned.